So hello, hello everyone. This is um, my name is Ahmed, and this is my uh, my second contribution to book clubs. Um, uh, like I'm presenting, this is new to me, so uh, bear with me. For if I if I got things wrong, feel free to interrupt. Um, so yeah, this chapter is very interesting because we have like, um, we have a full overview of how data science components are uh, are already built from the ground up. So. Let's go into the learning objectives first. Uh, so we we should learn what we should learn um, in this chapter. Um, so we should learn how to how the um, the differences between the software engineering uh, life cycle that it really happened when we build application for software engineers, and the uh, and data scientists when we when he build uh, application. So this is two different approach to to, to two different ideation. So yeah, this is the first point. Second point is the data storage solution, the format and the location of the data. Um, third point is uh, how we choose the solution. There is a lot of out there. We'll discuss a lot in this point. Uh, what cloud provider have also we will discuss in the last point. Uh, we will talk about data authorization, how you authorize the data and make it secure. Um, yeah. And when, then we will dive, uh, yeah, you would just scratch a bit on how uh, database as a service option uh, or what cloud provider are uh, offering in database as a service as, uh, as our database. Um, yeah, so let's begin. Um, yeah, first thing, let's talk about the perspective. Um, from, a, from a perspective, for me, especially if um, if I'm a software engineer or a data engineer, that uh, really comparing my my mindset to the data science and how it's the flow of our ideation is different, I would say it's um, this chapter is really from the perspective of an engineering standpoint more than the data science standpoint, and um, I think it's also from is that if you if you're DevOps software engineer data engineer you will kindly, or a data architect, a solution architect, you will kindly have some perspective or high high degree uh, of knowledge on uh, on how to build this, this kind of systems. Um, so, hello, Taneshi, how are, how, are you, how are you doing? Hey, sorry, I'm like, guys, I'm setting no up problem, some hardware no over here. No problem. Good to have you. So yeah, so we're talking about the perspective of um, software engineering versus uh, uh, or uh, or versus uh, the data science, um, the scientist perspective. And the book mentions that how how we are constructing our idea or how we think about um, the life cycle of uh, everyone, and one of the differences between the two is the data flows and data flows. Um, in, in, in the case of software engineering, in this, this kind of normal, normal software, we have normal software, have some application, uh, could be web application, could be mobile application, anything. And this kind of software um, is, uh, we're getting some kind of data from it. And um, the, the flow of data here is very differ is differed from one another. So in the data science, we, we have an historical data and then we try to uh, make a use of it and implement some application on top of it. So this flow, it, it, the flow is coming from the data itself, the historical data, and then goes to the application itself. Uh, alongside the, the, in, in the other side, the, the software engineer are, are using, our, our, um, we are collecting data from the, from the user, like some kind of having a form, some kind of click, click button, like uh, doing clicks on uh, on some buttons and then uh, collecting what what more what what could be more clicked, um, doing some A/B testing. We, this is how we collect data for A/B testing. And I think the, the main idea here is the norm the the, the data the data flow because it's different. Uh, it's it's really changed how we how how, how the life cycle goes. And because of uh, because of that, it's, um, it's it's really important to know that uh, there is two different data flows out there. Uh, software engineers thinks uh, in this particular data flow, and this 
and uh, data science think uh, like this. And we have historical data, of course, we have uh, the, the historical data itself goes. Um, here we could have like an front, this, this is a front end and this is a back end, but in, uh, in, the, data, in the data stack or the data, data science software, we could have a reporting system, we could have um, a machine learning model, we could have any, anything that depend on the data that come, that historical data. And this historical data maybe, maybe also could, could be, uh, are collected by this way. So it could, it could be we having a software. Uh, that's, that's how I see it in all, all the companies that we, we have some kind of software that's collecting some data and, and also people use it and we get revenue from it. And at the same time, we use it also to, to gain insight or to gain data that we could, could be used for analytics. So I think it's, it's complement one another. So we could use both of them uh, interchangeably. And at the same time, yeah, like we could use it, uh, we could use both of them at the same time, and uh, that's what I, I, that's what we were doing in uh, in my last company where where uh, we having an, a, some kind of application, and we getting um, uh, like um, creating just just created an application and using some SDK to anticipate what user are doing to in the, in the application more, what he's what he's like, what he don't like. And then all in, uh, get get good um, collect this data and, and send it into the data warehouse and then uh, use it in the data projects or, or the science projects afterward. Um, so this is how I see the um, yeah the um, okay. So the software in, the software engineering life cycle we have some kind of presentation layer. First layer is the presentation. Could be like um, like we said, an application interfaces or uh, a web application. So we have in the presentation layer. Then we have uh, um, an application layer where where, where the uh, where the cool comp uh, functionality is based on, and we have in then the data access layer or the data layer, uh, which is uh, it's it's really dependent on the business and this constructed we. We'll talk more about this uh, when we when we tell the differences between the business logic when we're creating the app, with the, uh, how we construct uh, or separate the business logic and the application logic, and this is the separation that we talk about. The, the application is 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 the layer and the uh, and um, uh, and the data layer is uh, the business. So business are in, in force or shape the data. Uh, according to the use case itself, uh, according to the business use case, we shape we shape the data as. Uh, so, yeah, this 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 is the structure of normal software application. Um, the other structure, the other life cycle, of the, or the science project that we could we could uh, really anticipate. I think more about um, software engineering, as we we said in chapter one that. Um, software software developer or software engineers have some kind of pre predefined requirement and according to those requirements we designed an application and we just follow the rules that already built but for data science project we don't have rules we just it's, it's part of creating the project itself it's an exploration and experimentation phase and this kind of uh, in, and this uh, exploration and inter, uh, experimentation phase have it's, it's a part of the cycle of creating that science project that's why it's very different it's it's, it's not it's really different how to think when, when you think about it uh, when comparing to the software engineers that's why it's more that you you progress when in uh, when you when you continue when you when you execute and in uh, in software software engineering you just have a self redefined uh, requirement and you just uh, implement those and that's it and of course you have uh, an agile methodology and you add feature afterward but I, i'm talking about the the main the main idea here so yeah uh, the seven layers of data science is it's like exploration refining um model creation uh yeah yeah it's 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 normal i think it's it's not that uh, we we do this and if we if anyone of you have uh yeah, participation in the, in in that science, and I, I should you you are. Um, 
you will see that um, a different layer here doesn't really all exist in some kind of project because if it, it could be a project that really aims to reporting not if, not deal with uh, model uh, any type of modeling and yeah so what do you think guys that's it, it, um i think it's you have some kind of you you created a application the science application that um that have this machine learning versus uh reporting uh kind of separation so what do you think yeah there was one thing i didn't and this is a really small thing but in the paragraph right, it says there are seven but then there were six listed i don't know if maybe one is going to be added or yeah it could be one added but i didn't i i didn't follow follow the this the, like the the services itself i follow the concepts uh, so we have like i don't need to define uh, define it really particularly but i i see them i see the meaning i see what where it's going for mm -hmm. um but I, uh, what I'm asking is, do you, do we as, um, like, do you as a data scientist, do you have like some separation between projects that really aiming for reporting and projects that really aiming for machine learning? Yeah, well, in in my company, analysts do reporting. Um, okay. like maybe the first time a report's done, a DS does it, uh, and then afterwards, it will be done mainly by analysts. Um. So we would have kind of a separation there, but there are definitely projects that we have that don't have any model training. Um, okay, so you don't have any model training? There, there are definitely projects where we don't have model training. Yeah, there are yeah. projects where we do well, have model it's training. It's just like basics, like just basic statistics kind of thing. I was gonna say the same thing. Um, yeah. There are a lot of, like in the data science pipeline that I'm familiar with, there's a lot of analysts who's, job it is quite literally to count things you know and um that is a you know in my opinion that's still a very valuable um layer of data science yeah yeah i totally agree because it's 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 required and it's really crucial to, to to begin with the data analysis analysis saying then continue to other stuff afterward yeah so yeah, yeah. I liked his call out as well that the because it's like I guess we all kind of know it if we're in industry it's like the model training is a tiny percentage of your time yep and he notes like that it's also really uh, open to automation which is quite funny there's a lot of good like auto ml stuff coming out yes it, yes this is the thing that drags everyone into data science and then actually they spend all their time in everything except model training which is pretty nice yeah, I think I think also the industry itself it's started to evolve toward uh, AutoML and ML ops, all the kind of operations that really will automate manual work for data science uh, just to operate efficiently afterward. Yeah. So yeah, let's continue with um, productionizing apps. So in the books, he he started to to give an idea of what what could of uh, architectural design we could use uh, in uh, formalizing or creating data science project in um, so yeah let's let's say yeah we'll yeah let's let's go back because I don't say is the last point we as a data engineer or data scientist or software engineer we really think of um, okay it's, it doesn't have to be like okay. Yeah, we think of the system as a puzzle pieces and we just attach this, this puzzle with each other or integrate each each component with each other to, to create a system. And this perspective is is, is, uh, is somehow different when you specialize in some component, it, like you do just ML, you do just uh, analysis, you do just um, uh, preparation job. So if you if you are really want that have want to have a bigger picture you have you should really um focus on the architecture of well. so that's why we're talking about architecture uh, in the first place um yeah so the productionizing apps here we're talking about the microservices and i think overall is the, mo the most used 
uh, architecture is um, is the mo monolith up monolithic. I think it's called monolithic approach to the de de developing application. And this monolithic approach is it doesn't is not a bad thing because you could have modularity inside of uh, an um, a monolithic uh, monolithic uh, application, like some one just one component that have some other components that integrated with each other, and but um, that fall in some point because the the relation or the the um, the relation between this, those components are really creating some kind of dependency, and uh, this dependency could be be uh, um, really inefficient in a way that um, yeah well, it it will be inefficient because if if some component that not related like let's say we have a an, a user um, a user component and uh, a threads so, so sorry for my <laughs> my 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 handwriting okay threads and we could have an items okay so yeah if uh, if we wanted to manage this kind of services uh, if, let's say it it's services and uh, every service have some kind of functionality every one of this component have some um, some functionalities that really in, in, in identify it so we can we could add user delete user or do some crud operation on the users and we could uh, we could also uh, do some business logic and so on the user, and of course, as as we said, um, dependency. If uh, if if some some functionality of the user is is, is been down or uh, something failed in the in the user functionality, the all the whole application because it's monolithic monolithic and uh, it um, dependent on the one another too hey too like tightly. Very tightly coupled, uh, the the whole application is falling down, and that's why that's why it's very uh, it's uh, that's why we coming to the architecture that is microservices architecture. But I would advise is if you are starting a new project and you you don't know the complexity yet, because uh, I think people are just going to microservices without uh, without realizing that it's it's really created for a complex really complex use cases. It's not like very simple applications that uses some data and that's it. The functionality itself is really matter on how we design, how we um, implement a design practice. So um, I would say the my, microservices itself is, is a good approach to do saying effectively and efficiently. But uh, yeah, let's define what, what microservices at first. The, the, the micro, microservices is like we have just like those kind of, those services, um, but instead of instead of have this whole, this huge file or huge uh, component that contains this these uh, smaller chunks of services, we have separate services uh, that interact with each other uh, uh, with an API. So we have an API layer uh, on top of those services. Um, let's let's say here we have an a layer, and we have services that really interact through this layer. So the these services are really uh, the it's the only thing that really uh, dependent de depend on is this uh, is use, uses of the API layer. So the API layer here. I think it's called API getaway or something. But the main idea is if if some of those services uh, failed, and yeah, it's if some of the services failed because it's really um, loosely coupled and doesn't dependent on one another. Because here we have a dependency and it's it's obvious. But here because if 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 this fall down or something. It doesn't affect other functionalities. So let's say we have a web application or application that really uses some web functionality, and um, the the user the user in this application failed, but um, the main the item is still is still working, and the threads or the forms are still working, but the users is failed. So 
yeah, since it's, it's not dependent on the on the other component, it will work. It will work. That's and that's the, the, that's really powerful because we we avoid we avoiding um, the the this kind of fault. We we try we transferring the system to fault tolerance system, where and other advantages of this approach is we could focus more on the on on this service. We could debug it, debug it better. We could test it better, uh, deploy it eas easier than just one chunk because we, we don't have a control. Here we have the full control, and yeah, this this, this is this is this idea is coming from I think the main coming from uh, something called uh, SRB, which is um, it's uh, it's it's um, it's an acronym for uh, yeah, single single responsibility principle, which is object design principle, and uh, it it implemented uh, in uh, it states that everyone component should have one responsibility and only one, uh, and also the another another concept in system design called uh, separation of concern, is also states that uh, the same thing every every component have one only one thing. And it, it should it shouldn't do more more than one thing because if uh, if it it's, it may it make it tightly coupled if you or totally dependent if you use this uh, this kind of uh, if you if you do it that way um, yeah so let's let's go to the idea of abstraction because this is this is really useful if you are new to APIs. The abstraction layer that has been built, um, it's been for built for a, for a reason. The the um, the use the definition of abstraction itself in software engineering is so is so beautiful. Um, I would say this, in software engineering, abstraction is uh, is uh, hiding really complex information from a user and really uh, exposing some stuff uh, that it, or exposing functionality that make it easier for anyone. That have access to those function to those kind of, those steps or functionality to to use your application, and it uh, it really makes sense for a software engineering or or a software developer that write code because it's 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 coming from the names application programming interface. It's just an interface that build uh, to help programmers are building them. To in, to make this, their system integra integrable with other components that other programmer are are built, so it's it's just a, a, a way to communicate with two systems, and because of that, it's really easy to to have, find uh, frameworks uh, like Fast APIs or uh, or or Bumber. Uh, uh, to just implement this kind of ar architecture or this kind of design, uh, how to build APIs, and it's really related. It's uh, it's just the, the design, the principle of an API is um, is really powerful because um, yeah, I I, 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 I want to, to to get more details from you guys. Do you use APIs on daily basis or not? Because I just want. Want want you to interact with this one? Yeah. Do you mean like uh, APIs other people have made, or APIs that I make? I think we could we could you say that you made you made at first, and then other people made. Yeah, because personally, I'm only just getting into now. Like I've I've known what a RESTful API is and stuff for a while, but I'm only just getting to the point where I feel confident enough to understand that something needs to be an API. And then maybe how to make it an API. But I interact with a lot of other APIs daily. Yes. And it's, it's so powerful that, that you make your your application is really uh, integrable. Like it's integrated, it could be integrated from in, in uh, from other systems. And it's it's like I think it's oh, it's it's more like a a container a container a container in in a way. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's. It, it's it's very powerful. So okay, let's continue. Um, yeah, the distinction between the business logic and the app logic. Um, when we're designing an application, I think it's it's more for data science application. Um, we have two log two logic, and 
it could be it could be unseparable. Um, we could have a monolithic type of projects that have those those two things in the same layer. But it's recommended in the book that you are uh, you uh, try to separate them. And the app logic is all about um, the user how the user interacts. Like the user clicks, the user uh, fill the form, how the animation ends up in your application. Some some kind of interaction between you between the application and the user. And the business logic is telling is, is about the business. And business is well, like we said how it shapes the data itself. So it's de dependent on the data. And yeah, so a lot of separate, the separation is very far, it's required, the separation, because if, if, you, if you're not separated, um, those, we, you will have a spaghetti code, of course, uh, first, and then we, the debugging will become like very difficult. We don't have separation, that's why that's, and, also, this is what this one is is um, is mainly when you when you when you will feel it when you uh, when you're trying to debug some applications that uh, it it is its business are mixed up with with app. I I I didn't see any one of those, but if you guys have have something to say about uh, this kind of monolithic building. Um, if you if you uh, dissipate one hour or so, you could you could say uh, what's your experience on this? So I mean, no one. Uh, yeah, I mean I'll jump in again. So, like strictly speaking, I think monolithic has a few different definitions, right? But when you're talking about apps, it kind of does have a negative connotation. It's like yeah. it's a bad way of designing things. I'm currently building like a medium complexity app i guess and my idea was to build it first like you said you don't know how complex it's going to be yes uh, then at some point you get to the you realize that oh, i needed to like modularize this earlier and it just does take forever to start making changes it's like i don't know almost quadratic complexity it's like each change means you have to check like you know another power worth of things yep. if you haven't designed it nicely at the start um, but then I guess that's just an experience thing. I guess like Gus and Tanasha have different experiences. Well, yeah, I think um, most, oh, well, mo I'll say most of my experience comes from um, academia, right? So we're, we're not, we weren't building a lot of things that were um, uh, per, like they weren't necessarily for large consumer bases. And most of the consumers were people who were, you know, sitting right next to us kind of thing. Um, and so building monolithic apps and monolithic solutions for data science was not um, as like frowned upon as it is in uh, industry. But I will say that one thing that we suffered with a lot was churn. So, you know, in academia, you, you hire a data analyst whose entire reason for being there is to publish a paper and then go to another institution right um and so sometimes you have people who show up do something amazing and then just leave um and because it's monolithic it's so so difficult to find somebody else to try and um take over that the role of, of lead developer and then support it um so i i agree that like monolithic approaches are are dangerous um but I also have found them to be, you know, super handy for uh, smaller teams, especially academic teams, where the 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 scientific knowledge is, is often shared very closely amongst all the members. Yeah, I, I say as well, you want to build fast first, and then you can refactor like all the way down into microservices and modules and APIs and everything. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, totally agree. Um, yeah. Okay, continue. Um, so, yeah, we could, we could think about what other things that we, when we think about that the science in production, we always think about CI/CD, of course, and we always think about uh, how we automate stuff, how to automate, how to manage services, how to um, 
the service in the cloud, of course, and how 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 really it, how to make it easier for anyone that's really new to the business uh, to use our um, or to have an on very easy onboarding on uh, on the application or development process of the application. And yeah, I, I think this is this one of in my um, in my experience is just um, it's very little, but. In the last, my last company, we were doing like uh, after I uh, yeah after I joined, I really we, they were having like some some onboarding documentation and and then uh, they they were describing what the whole system in details and how they are working on in, um, the productionizing their uh, their application or and how it's, it's integrated with um, with other applications. Um, and this helped me a lot. So the documentation here is very, very useful for uh, for getting apps to production because it's uh, it makes the onboarding uh, process very easy. And um, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, at least this is my experience. Do you do you guys have any experiences? Other thought about productionizing apps or having the science project to production, move it to production. I, I just know that um, the entire reason that I'm here and the entire reason that I'm interested in this book was because someone said to me one day that you can't productionize R. And I was very, very frustrated <laughs> because when I tried to prove them wrong, I couldn't find anything online about how to do that. <laughs> so I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that we're able to talk about it. I, I don't like my experience with productionizing has been with Python and that was aided by the fact that we had a vendor who we were building off of their API. And, you know, that's great. You know, you, you push something to pip and, uh, you know, the user just goes pip install and then you're all done, you know? Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, with R, there's not a lot of, there hasn't been enough talk, I believe, about, um, you know, plumber and uh, throwing something onto, uh, you know, digital ocean and just saying, hey, here's my uh, my little plumber thing. You just have to go to the URL and uh, you know make your API request, and, and you're all done. I think it's I, I think it's just not talked about enough, and I I really hope that we all can evangelize some more. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I agree. Same same thoughts. Yeah. Yes, and I I think with with this with kind of base, uh, I think we we will get eventually there. Um, especially for Docker and decronizing our apps and upload it to production to it will be very useful because it's it make it very integrable part creating integrable parts is very crucial for uh for us and it will make us having have some tools that will really use them daily basis in creating production apps yeah okay let's move on um so okay this question of this is a discussion question because there is a lot of format, uh, data formats that we could use. Uh, but I would say, let's say, um, in my experience, I, um, I, I was using uh, just CSV files and um, and does, don't have simple file. I, I think the parquet, parquet files is, is also, is designed in a way that really efficient. Um, to process bigger chunk of data, um, I don't know uh, any other any other format. But the um, there's a, there's a lot. There is a JSON file. There is um, uh, text files, um, and we will talk more about uh, how how this is is gets stored when when we go to the database as a service because we having some some. Um, some degree of um, separation here. Uh, we should know what is what's meant by is it a database and a data warehouse and the data lake differences, because uh, alongside with the, the, the solution itself, if you don't know those kind of things, it's um, it, it would really it would not make sense of how how we're getting stored in in real life. So yeah, at least this is my uh, my take on this. Um, I, I used uh, CSVs and I used um, what else? 
I didn't use parquet, but I, 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 I'm hearing that it's, it's very, it's used heavily in big data workload. When you're having big data workload, you should use parquet to just have in processing. And it's a columnar, column, columnar, I say column, column, yeah, column based uh, file or something like that. Um, that where you store the file itself as a column, not a sense row like uh, CSV. CSV is like a column, just uh, it's just structured this way. Like uh, we having we inserting column by column in the in the file, but it uh, and it read column by uh, sorry row by row uh, in the CSV, but in the in the parquet we we are inserting uh, in in. It, it, the column itself. The column is a, is a unit measure here, and that's because yeah, this 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 kind of structure is already it, it's it's built already in the data warehouse. Uh, how they design the engine to uh, to process data for analytics, speci specifically uh, specifically for analytics. Uh, um, yeah. Um, so, uh, anyone have a take on this? Yeah, I think when, depending on what you're doing, right? So yeah. leaving aside databases and what SQL and stuff you're going to use and where you're going to eventually start like that. When using R, if modeling especially, um, or just if like uploading to the cloud a lot and not using, say, Arrow um, and those formats, like the Parquet formats, then just like an RDS or an R data file, I find can be invaluable. Like you can store list columns, you can store model objects, you can store like essentially anything you like and compared to a CSV on just like tabular data, it's going to normally be multiple times smaller due to the compression. So I, I used to use CSVs a lot and now I say half the time, at least I'm using RDS or .R data files. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I, I agree with Jack. I think um, it also comes with the uh, territory of experience. Um, when you first start working with data, somebody introduces you to an Excel file, and then uh, you know you you move to R and you start trying to force Excel files into R, <laughs> um, and then you you move on to CSV because you realize that Excel is junk, and then eventually you start to think to yourself, oh well, you know what else is there? You know why why would I save something in RDS? Like you know it feels pretty useless, but then. Um, Eventually, I did start working with RDS as well. And but on on the um, topic of uh, parquet and stuff like that, you know, I think um, one thing that um, is happening, you know, I'm not I'm not an expert in the in in the field, but one thing that I feel is happening. Have you have you guys ever seen that um, comic that starts off with one panel where two guys are discussing and they say, you know, we have uh, twelve standards for uh, this particular uh, software engineering principle, and uh, I think we need to unify them. And the other guy says, "Great." And uh, you know, two panels later, they say, "Well, we have thirteen standards now, and uh, I think we need to unify them under one more new one." Um, <laughs> and I, I have a, a a sinking feeling that this may be happening to file types. Yeah, the XKCD, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Gus. Um, the um, I have a sinking feeling that um, when it comes to large data file types, we may be heading in that direction because my experience with um, large file types moved from uh, you know large Excel files to large CSVs to oh, just put it in a Mongo database or just put it in a MySQL. And then somebody told me to use HDF5. And then somebody told me to use Arrow. And then somebody mm -hmm. told me to use Parquet. So, you know, I, I, I'm I worrying about this standards creep that seems to be happening. Um, but again, I'm not an expert in the field. I think that the standards creep is more it'll end up being geared towards specific kinds of data so that like there might be just like a, a few good generic data formats. So there you have like your CSVs or our datas or whatever. And then if you have like a specific kind of data or it'll be use case based or like, I know at work, a lot of what we do is in Databricks. So we're using Delta tables a lot. 
And that's really great for time-based data because you can partition it on time. So you end up with these really fast uh, returns on, like essentially so long as you're including time in your query, you're, it'll come back really fast. Whereas on another kind of data format, it won't necessarily have the same time uh, runtimes. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So we're just getting into arrow as well at work because you can kind of do the same stuff with arrow data, right? Like you can make yeah grouped by and, month or week or year or something. Yeah, it's um, it gets a little complicated. I ran into it in when I was doing some stuff in Python that you had to set uh, Apache Arrow um, like compatibility in Databricks in order to get some of the faster times back. Cool, I didn't know that. Awesome. Okay, so let's continue. Um, yeah, factors that we should consider when you choose our storage. Um, I think this is dependent on the use case again. Uh, we, we keep coming back for the use case because it's dependent on the company and the business itself. Um, it's all dependent on the business. And here we talk, we could talk about more, more about uh, the data access patterns that we have in, uh, into our application. And, and I think more, more of it, we, we could think of, of also how we designing the data pipeline at the first place or how we, how we design this, um, the, the cloud structure or the cloud architecture. Um, the application, in you know, application level, is it, is it is our data is it static or it's changing uh, very dynamically or not? This is how, how we could uh, specify if it uh, if if it's need to store be stored or separated from the actual app. If it's not, then uh, it's static data, so it's really uh, doesn't change. And it's uh, it's really dependent on the 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 dynamic the dynamicity of um, of how the data is stored uh, or how it's it's used in the app. Um, in 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 the cloud architecture perspective, um, I think the access pattern is all is how we decide on the costing. I think so. I would say if if you know that you have uh, some type of data that is really is used very frequently, you would you will use some type of um, pricing model. I think they're, they're in AWS having some a lot of pricing strategies and. For frequent access and uh, unfrequent access, and if if you have an archiving data, data we we'll, you will use some other uh, pricing uh, strategy. So it's dependent also in uh, on the cost. So here we talk about the cost optimization. This is one of the main factor when we choose a storage solution because we want to minimize the cost as it, as we could. Um, so I I think if uh, if you if you use S three which is we we'll talk about more more about S three as our uh, our component for storage, um, you will really have to to think more about uh, uh, is how the data is accessed the access uh, is is it accessed very frequently daily on the daily basis and hourly basis does it access on quarterly basis uh, does it access does it access in one time in a, in a, just one time in a year, uh, or to, and depending on the access pattern, you choose the pricing, and and because of that, you are really uh, optimizing a lot of stuff. And I think the S three having some in, uh, inter, um, some strategy uh, it's called I think intelligent tiering, S three S three intelligent tiering, which is which um, really choose um, change as um, um, change of the, the pricing depend on all, depend on the access the data access by itself automatically. So you don't have to do anything. Just just choose uh, this intelligent tiering um, uh, pricing, and it will eventually change change itself depending on the usage the data usage. And I think it's it's it's, it's a good idea of uh, of really uh, marketing yourself as a as a as a cloud provider and also um a, a great idea to to reduce cost for because customer love to reduce cost of course um yeah 
we could talk about more about the, the security. Uh, I don't know if if it's okay to to pass on our uh, in this session. What do, what do you guys think? Because we have a lot of stuff also to to cover. I think he just doesn't have enough storage space. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, you know, I don't have big thoughts. I kind of have a quite a tight deadline, so I, I have to go at seven. Oh, well, in ten minutes. Um, okay. So okay. No problem. So let's 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 wrap it up uh, very quickly. I, I I will try to make it. Cool. Uh, we'll try to make it very quick. So in the security level, we 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 could have like some some best practices and in, in, internally and when we develop in the apps. And when uh, when we're talking about the security level on the in the, um, the cloud provider itself, could use an I I am I think it's called I am it's identity access management tooling in the cloud, and then having access uh, to secure just access and give permissions um, to yeah. And how yeah we could design for our how how the data are big or not. I don't know if it's um, yeah, it's it's dependent on the data, of course. We, if it if we have like big data, different than we have uh, just terabytes, some couple of data terabytes uh, of data, and uh, it's dependent. We we choose the solution dependent on this. Um, this is an important factor, and other performance criteria. I don't. I will not go through through those because of time. But I think with the more performance criteria that really. Uh, um, uh, prometized or um, uh, market, marketed by the, uh, the cloud provider is the throughput and the, the latency. Um, and uh, it's very crucial because it's um, uh, you, ch you change your solution based on those two. And also the, the services is designed in a way uh, to have different, uh, different aspects of those two. Um, yeah, let's move on to uh, authorization. So we just we talk, don't allow all the user to have all access of data because this is could be could could a reason could be a reason for disaster. And uh, um, I think if anyone that doesn't have the the permission to do uh, it, should it should be managed. The permission should be managed by uh, some manager uh, to manage the cloud, giving access to people. Of course, analysts have some. Some restriction. Data scientists have some restriction. Do we, the science work or with just machine learning or something? And data analysts just working with reporting. And uh, the data engineers or the data or, or software engineer are really working with uh, with uh, how to implement the services with each other or integrate the services with each other. So yeah, this is an important point. Um, yeah, but putting the yeah, we avoid ever putting this credential in the plain text because this is very dangerous. Uh, it's pretty, you, you, it's, it's just, uh, I will not talk about this because it's easy. Uh, it's, I, I, don't, I didn't see any, any of those uh, in the real world. Um, basically, I will, uh, the, the, the fourth point here, I, I using this approach, the trivial approach, uh, I use it in my daily life, in my daily projects my own portfolio project and also i use it in production uh, and it works fine I didn't see uh, any uh disadvantages of using this um just in, in uh, storing environment a credential environment valuable and then um I use this credential in uh, in your application or in uh, uh, in any type of uh, authenticating uh the users um our our studio connect is also, um, I, I didn't have experience with our with our studio connect, um, but I think it's it's offer an, an encryption in uh, on runtime. Uh, if any one of you tried our studio connect and uh, to store its credential, uh, feel free to uh, say uh, one or more thing about it, because I I I didn't have I don't have uh, any experience with this. Okay, no one. Okay, let's let's continue. Um, okay. So here we are. We try to describe the database as a service, and um, we should have 
uh, at least a formal a formal idea of how what was the difference between a database and um, a data warehouse and a data lake. So basically, the database is an old TP, which is a transactional uh, type of databases, row based databases, uh, and it's it used a formal applic application. Any software engineer will use the MySQL or uh, uh, Postgres or any type of relational databases. This kind of database is uh, uh, relational. Also, we have uh, a non-relational database, which is NoSQL. Uh, but the main idea is it's just uh, relational and non-relational. And it's, it doesn't optimize in a way to, uh, to perform calculation, heavy calculation, or, or having a query, um, a really have a small query time. Because we when when so this is was a problem so so it is this problem and make make people invent uh, what's called data warehouses which is uh, it's column based databases that really treat the column treat the um, uh, it's a unit of measure which is a column um, as uh, um, like it's, we want to have an um, like some kind of statistic on on this column so we have we have we could summarize we could uh, we could sum, uh, minimize, uh, give the, getting the minimum or the maximum. If we want to do this, the, it's, it's optimized in a way that uh, it, it makes the processing really easy. Um, and I will not go deep into this. I, I could, but it's because of the time. And the data lake solution, the data lake solution, both of those, um, it's, it's, okay, both of those type of databases are really uh structured more than structured databases but when we move to uh we want to have a, another use cases which is unstructured databases and semi-structured uh or semi-structured data at all um we we tend to have we should have some kind of solution that really fit of all like have have the structured data and the semi-structured and um uh the non-structured data so we uh it's invented it's called data lake and uh, it, uh, it really means that you use uh, some storage system or some storage services in the cloud to uh, have its objects objects uh, object based uh, storage and we and here we we are mentioning s3 which is an object storage in in aws which is which is a, um, uh, a cloud provider and it's uh, by amazon um, and we just having some kind of uh, unstructured, uh, structured and semi-structured, unstructured. Why we are using this kind of uh, of database solution? Because we we could apply the, then deep learning or uh, machine learning on uh, on non-structured data like images or something like that. So yeah, it's very useful and it's implemented a lot in in a, in a lot of companies and. Some companies are not getting enough with the data warehouses. Some companies are uh, implementing the data lake. Other companies are creating, uh, are implementing uh, the data lake house, which is data breaks. Um, it's it's dependent on the the, the 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 company, the big the data, the how big the data and how how the function, uh, how company is functioning uh, as a first. Okay, so the recommended solution here. Is EBS, RDS, and Redshift. Redshift is a is a data warehouse um, solution for uh, that offered by Amazon by AWS. There is existing uh, this uh, uh, Google Cloud um, uh, are offering BigQuery, but um, because it's cheaper, I, I think it's BigQuery. It's cheaper. I, I I use it on my portfolio project and in in production. It's cheaper than Redshift in with yeah like. A lot of um, a lot of uh, huge differences, um, but it's optimized. Uh, I think BigQuery is uh, is good for a smaller project, if you uh, and big project of course. But uh, some 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 businesses are like to have the full stack in a, a specific cloud provider. That's why uh, we we could have a, a lot of services from the same cloud provider that doing. Uh, data offering some data storage solution, and RDS here is a, is a relational database service which uh, which offers uh, a, a, a service a serverless um, uh, ser database service to uh, this could be MySQL, Postgres, and 
SQL Server um, in the cloud and you can could manage it uh, and use it uh, in your application if you have a structured data. Again, you could use multiple factors, like we could use this one and this one to construct a data lake, uh, of course, and this one to construct a data lake solution. Uh, yeah, and EBS is uh, elastic, uh, elastic bean stock, I think. It's, yeah, it's block storage, yeah, elastic bean block storage, which is some kind of other solution, another type of solution that really based on how we could uh, store stored data in um, uh, blocks uh, at the same machine. Like EC, we have, if, if you have EC2 instance, which is um, a server in the cloud in AWS, we rented some server, okay. And we have, we want to have a storage that really, uh, really close to the server. Uh, uh, we could use the EBS to store stuff, but it's not, uh, it's, it doesn't persist data, so it's it could be forgotten. Uh, if if we switched uh, off the EC2 instance, that's why you should be careful. But there is a solution around this, which is EBS uh, snapshot, I think. Um, but yeah, it's uh, this this could be implemented and designed. If if one is, is solution architect, will you will work most of the those kind of uh, uh, database as services. Uh, to construct a solution, a data analytic solution, uh, but just using AWS. And all cloud provider also could have the same thing. Um, yeah, is that all we got? No, it's, there, is, there is a lot of services that are out there uh, from each cloud provider that really mentioning how, uh, how easy to use cloud uh, to migrate from on another. And because of that, uh, it's, uh, it's it's similar to learn if you learn one cloud provider you could use other cloud provider very easily and yeah that's that's it i uh, I'm, I'm talking one minute we, we take one hour so thank you everyone for being here and sorry if i uh, if i make it very quick but we have just a deadline so okay thank you so much ahmed um, this was Thanks. this was really awesome to listen to. Awesome, awesome. pretty cool. Thanks, guys. Um, I think for uh, yeah, I, I was gonna say I think for the um, next meeting we should be off next week because it's uh, I think it's American Thanksgiving next week, but I'm it not is American entirely sure. Thanksgiving next week. Okay. But, yeah. Hang on, I have the calendar. Let me pull it up real quick, and I can. Give a definitive answer. Um, it talked to Jean in the. I do not see. I do not see it scheduled for next week. Okay, so it's it's already. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so we'll we'll ping John to be sure, but it sounds like next week we will be meeting. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. I will mention him in the in the Slack channel. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone, and have a good day. Thanks, Ahmed. Thanks, guys. Thank See you guys. Bye.